in class. We don't get those little tidbits, so I wanted to share. I hope that you benefit from some of these opportunities that are available to you. In Chapter 6, we're talking about methods, and methods are referred to by many different names, and so we'll just say you might have heard of them as modules, or subroutines, or procedures, oh, or functions, I left out that word, functions. So we have heard of methods under many different names, but no matter how we've heard a method referred to, we know a method or a module is a chunk of code, and that chunk of code is defined and can be executed like by name, so we can call the method by name. We use methods to separate functional tasks in the program and to eliminate redundant code. And our methods give us an opportunity to implement a modular, maintainable programming style. We can have different people working on different methods. We always are trying to eliminate duplicate code. And so far in the programs that we've been working on, we haven't seen a lot of duplicate code. But as we get further along, we'll see things where we tend to repeat ourselves quite a bit. And we always want to remember less code is best code, right? And we'll just make stuff up as we go. But it is better if we can be more concise with our code. So a method is kind of like, if you think about it, the chorus to a song. It's something that repeats over and over. So. It could be a recipe that you use over and over. You go back to that certain spot, find that recipe, and reuse it. We could also think of it as kind of like doing the laundry, a chore that we do over and over and over. So we know what all the steps are. Um, we just repeat the steps. We don't want to have to relearn and figure out how to do that thing every single time we go to do it. So something that could be repeated, something that's done the same way each time, and something that may result in something to eat, like our recipe, or not. When we're using Java, a Java method really has three main parts. The method header, the method body, and the method closing. The method header looks something like this, and we'll get into that. We start out with the modifier, public static is what we're going to use right now. We might also see private and other terms. Then we have our return type. This is a void method because it has the word void as the return type, meaning that it does not return any data. Then the method name. Then our parameter list is enclosed within parentheses. Then at the end of the method header, we have our opening curly brace to start the, the method body. So this above information will declare a method named my method. The method expects a double value as a parameter, and because it's void, it returns no value to its caller. So you've used some methods so far. Um, one that you've used is print line, print ln, and that's a Java method that's available from the system. We can write our own user-defined methods, and that's what we're going to do this chapter. So again, if we look at something where we're defining our own method, we have our method header, and then we have the code inside the method, all of the things that execute when that is working, and then we have the closing curly brace. We have our opening curly brace there. Now, we have a method here defined. So let's look at this code. We have a method named my method. We have a method named main. So that's our main method that we've been putting all of our code in so far. So in this main method, we only have one line of code. And in that one line of code, we say, I want to run the command my method, and I want to pass to it the number 7.5. Well, here is the method my method. It's declared with its method header, public static void my method, and then it declares what kind of parameters need to be passed to it, and it says it's expecting a double. And while it gets to work with that data, it's going to refer to that data as my variable. So this value 7.5 will be passed in is my variable. So in 
our method, my method, we'll just output this message, the variable is, and the variable value. So our output would be, the variable is, 7.5. So start seeing those connections as to how we're tying the method name together, and then within parentheses, the data that's being passed to the method. Now this method header is set up to return a value. So again, it starts out with its modifier, public static, and then our return type, this go round is set to int to say that this method is gonna return an integer value to its caller. Then again, we have our method name and our parameter list within parentheses, and at the end, our opening curly brace. This statement will declare a method named my method that expects a double value as a parameter and returns an integer value. This is an example of a method that returns a value. Here's our method header. And then the code within our method is pretty short. We have a short method body. It simply says return the value zero. Sorry, with the font it looks like an O. I promise it's a zero. I don't know why I've got somebody's weird email address back there. That is so weird. And then finally, our closing curly brace. Now, when we return a value, we return by using the return keyword. After the word return, we specify what data should be returned. And that could be a variable or a certain literal like 7.5. And we can only return one thing from one method. So we can't have a method that says return this data comma that data comma some other data. Only one thing. Here's our code where we've changed it about a little bit and our method now is going to return an integer value to its caller. We've changed that method header to change the word void to the data type word int. Now remember this has to be a valid data type there. So I could have string, double, decimal, int, you know, some sort of valid data type because I'm basically saying this is a holding spot for a variable that's gonna be returned back to the caller. So here's my method header. And in the code, we're still outputting the message and then we've added another line of code to say we want to return an integer that is my variable times two. Now I've used that cast keyword int within parentheses because my variable started out as a double and I'm saying I'm going to return an integer. So we have to be aware of some data type conversions like that. And in this case, I just told Java, it's okay, just go ahead and chop it off, chop off the decimal place and make this an integer. So that's what's gonna happen there. Now let's look at our call to our method. In our previous code, we saw that our method call was just my method with a value. In this case now, we're setting up a data variable location and memory to hold that return variable, that value that we get back from our method. So the way this statement works is an integer is going to be allocated in memory and it's going to be named return variable. Then the system is going to execute the procedure or the method, my method, passing the value 7.5. We're going to come up here, execute our method, execute all our lines of code, and then we're going to return the value, what's that going to be? 15. It, it ends up that it doesn't have any decimal places anyways. And it's going to return that variable 15 and place that value in return variable. And then finally, we'll output our message the return value is. So this will be our output. Now our parameter list could have more than one parameter. Now, our return variable list cannot. We can only return one thing. But we can ask for multiple pieces of input data to our method. So in this case, we have a parameter list. Each parameter has a name, and each parameter has its data type that it declares. In this case, we have a double 
variable that we'll call my variable and an integer variable that we'll call my int. Parameters are in order and they're separated by commas. What do we mean by in order? We mean that these parameters always have to stay in this same order. So if we call this method, we would use the method name, my method, and then within parentheses, we would pass the two arguments that would be loaded into our parameter values. So we would end up with 7.5, and my int would be the value 1. So whatever order our parameter list is, is the same order our argument list needs to be. And again, our argument list, when we're calling a method, it can be variables or, you know, whatever you want it to be. That'll be fine. Now, all of this information the method header contains works to create the method signature. Our modifier, our return type, our method name, and our parameter list. The lines got a little off, sorry and it's all used to formulate the method signature. That is what is used by Java to uniquely identify this method. So it's not just the method name, it's the method's return value, data type, the method's argument data types, all that stuff is used to create the method signature. This is important because we can overload a method. So in our case, we started out with our method that we said returned an integer value and expected a double and an integer parameter. We could actually declare the same method, my method, and say, oh, yep, I'm going to return an integer. But for this method, I'd like my argument, my parameter, to be a string, and I'm going to call it my string. Then we could have code within this method that handles our data as a string. In this method, we would have code that handles our data as a double and an integer. Then we could overload again, and we could say, now, instead of returning an integer, this time I'm going to allow a string value to be returned. So we would change our method header, our method signature, to make the return value a string. And then the code we had within this method would be a little bit different, again, to return a return value of a string. Why might we want to do that? Why might we want to overload things? Well, maybe we want to give our users the opportunity to search their checking account using an amount and using an account. And we could run the search the same, but we have to set up our search key and we do that in a method that's been overloaded so that we can accept a string or a double. So lots of different reasons that we might want to do that, but it gives us a huge amount of capabilities and it's a big part of object-oriented programming. So we still have in NetBeans our looping program. Let's take a look at this here. Chapter 5 test. Okay. And this is the one that I was thinking about. So if I look at this program, I'll go up to the top here. This is chapter three's exercise five. And we did this in the chapter three video. And what we do here is we prompt the user, actually we updated it in our looping chapter to make it into a looping program that continues prompting the user until they enter a terminating value to make the loop stop. So while our user's choice says they'd like to continue, we're going to ask them for the day and the number of days that have passed since that day, and then we're going to convert each of those days to an alpha equivalent. Now in this case, it doesn't look really like we have duplicate code, right? Because we used an if-else-if -if structure for this check up here, and down here we used a switch case structure. But if we look at it, basically it's the same code because we're checking to see, you know, if our day number is zero, we're setting our day value string as Sunday. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's create a new method. And I'm looking at my code here. I had the curly brace 
that's the end of that big while loop set here and it's after that that I want to be sure that I'm adding my method but it's not just right after that because if I did that I would be adding my method into my main notice the highlighted curly brace I'm sure you've seen that and I don't my main is already its own method it's the main method so I don't want to put my new method inside of there I want to put it after so I'll go ahead and label that closing curly brace that's the end of my main method and I'm going to create a new method here and we said first we start out with public static and then a return value and in our case we're going to return a string and that's what we're working with here is all of these day strings so let's say that our method is going to be called um, find day and what we expect to be passed is an integer and it's going to be day num. Now the compiler is still mad at me. I'm not done creating my method because I need my curly braces. And then everything is sort of happy. What's it complaining about? Oh, it says missing return statement. So even though I don't have all those errors I had before, because we said in our method signature, in our method header, we can return a string, it's going to continue giving us an error until we actually put that return statement in our code. Now, it's going to be easy enough to create this code. What I think I'm going to do is I know that my day is going to be given to me in a variable day num. So I'm going to use that case statement because it's really efficient. And I'm going to switch up day num. And for day num, just like our previous example, if our case is zero, we want to, um, we could at this point just return. But if we do things like that within our case structure, it gets the compiler kind of confused. So I think I'll set up a string variable and it's going to be day name. And I'm going to go ahead and give this string value an initial value of a space. Now, if it's case zero, we want to set our day name equal to Sunday. And then we want a break. And if our case is one, etc. So we know where this is going. Let's copy this. Our message. So I'm just going to call this day name. So I'll copy that and paste it. And I'm double clicking, if you can't hear, on that variable name to select it. So I can control V to paste that other new variable name and I'll grab all these and back tab which is shift tab and that should clean us all up okay so our switch case statement is pretty well done here let's check it we're saying switch it up on day num if day num is zero set day name to Sunday finally if we get down to default where we haven't found our day we're going to return un uncone, unknown, and then after our switch statement, we're going to return day name. That's the value that we want to return to our caller.
and up here. Sorry, it's a sharp moment. Okay, so up here we want to say that this method will determine the day name. Now, we've got our method set up. We need to change our main to use it. So up here, let's look at our big else if structure. We're using name for today here is our variable. And we're going to set our variable equal to the output from our find day method and the argument that we want to pass to our find day is this today variable. So in our old code we were going around and we were saying um, if today is zero I want to set it to Sunday etc etc etc. We're going to replace all of that now with these this line of code, this one line of code that says set name for today equal to the return value from find day using an argument of today. So now I can get rid of all that. And then we have our calculation for future day. So we can replace everything again in the same way. We're going to say name for future day, which is our output variable here from this one, is going to be equal to find day using future day. And then we can get rid of our switch case because we've moved it down here. Then we have our output statements. Today is name for today, and um, our output, and I think we're ready to test. Does it look good? Now, creating this method, if you notice, did a lot of different things. We didn't really exactly have duplicate code, but we could have. I mean, we were doing the same exact thing, the same function. So we replaced that with one method that does that work for us. And this method returns a value, and it's a string value, and that string value is the name of the day. Now, as we look at our main, notice that besides just kind of cleaning things up a little bit in our main method, it made our while loop body much more compact, and that's very desirable because now that while loop is much more maintainable. We can see the beginning and ending of it, and anytime we see a block of code getting very huge like that, we think, hmm, maybe I should be breaking this up into something a little bit different. So we could probably put some more methods in here, but these are, this is a very good start. So let's run this. Let's find our error window. I've got output. I'll reset windows. If you notice, this is a warning and it says that day name is never used, but we know it is because it's embedded within that switch case statement. And I have some other things. So it's this project here that it's mad at me about. So I will close that and go back to our project that we're working on. So notice it's 
as you have more tabs open using NetBeans, it does care if there are errors in some. Run it. Which one are we on? Okay, so this is the day. Would you like to check a day? Zeros? Yes. So, yes, I would. Oh, that's where that zero came from in my code. Sure. Enter today's day. Four. Enter the number of days. Eight. Today is Thursday and the future day is Friday. That looks right. So everything is still working. And the reason that it's working, even though it had an error, is because it's these weird zeros where I was typing in my code. So I'm going to click to stop instead of you being a good user and clean this up. Now, this program is nothing that's super fancy, but it's a very nice one for us to look at how we can quickly create a method that returns some sort of value. Now we could add some additional things to our program if we liked. Let's set up a method that decides if it's a weekend. How's that? So I'm going to start out public static. Now we want to return something here. Let's return a boolean value because we're going to say true if it's a weekend, false if it's not. And so let's say is weekend. And what we expect to be passed to us is again the day number that we're working with. 